Hello and welcome everyone to the damage report with Francesca Fiorentini. Yes, because of the state of patriarchy, which is at sort of red alert levels, um, we've ousted John Iderola. And so you get me for the rest of the week. And I hope you are thankful because uh, it's the least we can do on this show, honestly. Um, and with me for a Thursday, here on the Damage Report is host of the Hysteria podcast, Aaron Gloria Ryan. Aaron, how's it going? It is going. It continues yeah. to go. Somehow. Uh, yes, yeah, somehow it continues to go. I'm here, you're here. That's good. That's a good start. It is. It is. I appreciate us just being like, yep, it is what it is. Don't <laughs> ask me how I am. How is that even still a question? I don't know. We're going to have to come up with a new one. Like, yeah. how are you doing? No, it's like, well, you made it. Exactly. <laughs> we are going to get into a lot of things in this hour, in this show. Um, obviously, starting off with updates to um, the SCOTUS decision on Dobbs and the reaction from Democrats. Um, it seems like maybe that stick that the meme is pointing at Democrats, like, do something. Like, maybe that's happening a little bit, maybe not. Um, and then we will get into uh, OJ Simpson and his take on. Defunding the police, the answer might surprise you or not, I guess. Um, and then a little bit more, of course, from our favorite Marjorie Taylor Greene, because we have to lighten the mood. And for some reason in this week and in these times, Marjorie Taylor Greene lightens the mood. I don't know how that's possible, but it's true. Um, so if you don't mind, while you're here, like the stream right now, share that damn stream. Uh, send us your super chats and your comments, I'll be reading them in the breaks. Without further ado, Aaron, are we are we are we ready? Ready as I'll ever be. All right, let's do it. So it looks like President Joe Biden may be budging somewhat on his stance that he doesn't believe in reforming or changing the filibuster rules in order to codify Roe v. Wade or make abortion rights into law across the land in the United States. In fact, just this morning in Spain, I don't know what it was. Spanish air, the water, the pressure from the international community, from developed nations that do have better abortion rights than the United States at this point. But Biden is now backtracking on that statement and saying, no, he's now willing to advocate for amending, changing, suspending the filibuster as they did for, again, remember the federal budget with a giant deficit. Um, to do that in the case of Roe v. Wade. So he put out this tweet after the statement saying, we have to codify Roe v. Wade into law. And as I said this morning, if the filibuster gets in the way, then we need to make an exception to get it done. Um, remember, it was the second time that Biden has uh, ever advocated for reforming the filibuster. Um, he urged Congress to scrap its rules requiring a 60 vote threshold in the Senate um, to pass a specific piece of legislation in January. He called on lawmakers to make an exception to the rules to pass legislation to add voting rights protections. And how'd that work out? So at least in theory, he is down for it. In practice, of course, we still have Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who who knows where they stand. But Aaron, what do you think of this step forward potentially for a democratic strategy to combat what the Supreme Court has done? I I think I'm I'm not just speaking for myself here when I say I'm a little bit gobsmacked at the lack of plan. This seems like so reactive and we knew this was coming. You know, like we when the when the Dobbs opinion leaked back in April, we knew that this was coming. So I don't understand why we weren't spending the last 3 months in a full court press or 2 months in a full court press like figuring out what we're going to do when this happens. Yeah. And it instead it's like we're our leadership, Democratic leadership is acting like this is some kind of a surprise and oh, well, what are we supposed to do now? And it's like, you had two months, you mm -hmm. had you had more than two months. You had from the moment that Joe Biden took office and we had the Senate and we had the House of Representatives, we had time to strategize about what we would do. I am so tired of a party that is just reacting to things that activist judges do rather than anticipating things that activist judges might do. We could have gotten out, right. of, out ahead of this. And it's so frustrating, it's so frustrating to see such a lack of urgency from 
the president on this. Now, I will caveat by saying that this is better than nothing, which is what we were getting before. So I will take anything that is not nothing. And um, but there's also the, there's also this Francesca, like the filibuster is so silly. It is so silly. And the more I learn about it, the more I'm like, so they can just ignore it sometimes. Whenever they, why weren't we just doing this more? Like, why aren't we just trying to actually lead with the power that we have? It's very, very frustrating, but I'm glad that the president has decided that he wants to end the filibuster on this. If this is all we get, it is certainly not enough, but it's something. Right, right, exactly. I don't, I will see, and we're gonna talk a little bit about later whether it's enough to bring people out to the polls in, in the midterm elections, which seems to be the main strategy here. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, earlier in the week, we looked at Vice President Harris's response to this. And, you know, it's like you're talking to a friend. Like, that's how I feel like she's like, so speaking with the leadership of my friend. Who's going like, God, you know, it's really different when it actually happens versus like, I knew it was gonna happen, but like when it happened, that was literally her response. And the moment that Donald Trump got elected, the reason there was a massive millions of people in the streets was because we all saw this coming, right? In 2016. And so the first chance that a Democrat gets into office, they better Trump proof or Republican Christian national extremist proof the government. And he didn't in so many different ways. And I know the pandemic, we're always in a crisis. When Obama came into office, you had eight years of Bush, you had then a financial crisis. There's someone who also for going back farther in history did not choose to codify Roe v. Wade either or pass the, the Freedom uh, the, the Freedom of Choice Act, excuse me, yeah. So, but it seems like maybe some pressure from other Democrats inside the Senate, inside Congress are working. Um, more than 30 Senate Democrats signed a letter to Biden, urging him to fight back, take bold action and lead a national response to this devastating decision after the court overturned the right to abortion. Um, now there's there's some other things that apparently are in the works. It's not just this, supposedly we'll see. Um, the White House plans, uh, according to Reuters, to include a range of executive actions in the coming days, as well as promising to protect women who cross state lines for abortions and support for medical abortion. Cool. So there's there's like, I remember earlier that before the filibuster part, the only thing they had was we protect the right to travel. You know? Yeah. Doesn't the Constitution already do that? Like, that's, that's like, we can do that. You know, like, it's really weird that there's sort of like, we're gonna make sure that you have a right that you already have. Yeah, we, we, we do have that right. Thank you. Um, but another thing, why wasn't this just at the ready? Why wasn't mm. this just ready for when Dobbs came down? They should have had somebody, one aide whose only job was to just clutch a press release holding all of these points and run it to the press the second Dobbs hit. Yes. And they, they didn't, because that would have at least made me feel as someone who voted for Joe Biden in the election in 2020, like my needs were in some way being prioritized and the needs of more than half of Joe Biden's voters were being prioritized. It just seems like such, it seems like such an own goal. I mean, I don't like mm -hmm. to talk about this politically because this is people's lives we're talking about. This is millions and millions and millions of people's lives and personhood that we're talking about. But like politically, like if that's why, what, what is it? What is he doing? I don't understand. Um, yeah, I, I'm baffled. In fact, today, uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson is being sworn in um, as Justice Breyer retires. Obviously, that will not change the makeup of this um, right leaning and right majority um, conservative Supreme Court. It won't change that balance, but it is noteworthy. And I wish we were in a better place to celebrate the first African American woman to sit on the Supreme Court. Um, but when it comes to actually helping someone like Justice Brown Jackson out in terms of like, you know, padding it a little bit, that's off the table. So this is again, according to Reuters and their reporting with 
Senior White House officials privately, Biden has expressed skepticism about a wide range of Supreme Court reform proposals, including restricting the court's power, setting limits for just term limits for justices, and strengthening ethics and transparency rules, according to a person involved in conversations weeks prior to the most recent Supreme Court decision. And mind you, you got maybe the filibuster in in writing on a tweet. Yes, I want to reform it, change it for this instance. Um, but beyond that. That seems like as much as the White House is willing to do, at least from now until you know when. Um, so for example, the White House does not support calls to allow abortion providers to work from federal property because it is worried the government won't be able to keep them safe on or off the property, two sources explained. Um, in terms of offering federal funding to women traveling out of state, that also it's okay, you can travel, but you gotta fund it on your own because if we help you, we could run afoul of the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits federal funding of abortions, except in cases of a risk to a mother's life, rape or incest, which once again, in some of these draconian states, there's a little, there's like a carve out for that. If even those victims can get access to abortion care and coverage. But Joe Biden supported the Hyde Amendment until 2019, until it was clear he was running for office. And folks were like, why do you still support this? And then he had to drop it at least on paper. But it seems like tacitly he's still supporting it. Um, before I let you jump in, Nancy Pelosi, who's in Italy right now for some reason, I don't know why. Um, she outlined specific legislation that Democrats will consider, including shielding women from criminal prosecution if they travel out of state to seek an abortion and protecting women's personal data stored in reproductive health apps from state lawmakers. So again, the ground moves, everything changes more to the right. Things get worse and worse and worse and Democrats, do they hold the line? No, we are fighting now on the grounds that Republicans have set out for us. Okay, so you won't be prosecuted for traveling. Okay, well, we'll make sure that apps can't track you. It's like, yeah. None of this should be happening in the first place, but Aaron, please. Yeah, um, this is, yeah, it seems very much like, okay, so quick story time. One yeah. time I was in negotiations for a job and I was talking to this like editor that I'm friendly with. And he's he told me, stop, right now you are sounding like when Bugs Bunny convinces Elmer Fudd to argue with himself. And I feel like the Democrats are like Elmer Fudd. <laughs> like talking themselves into a worse and worse deal and like Republicans are the Bugs Bunny. You never wanna be the Elmer Fudd. You always wanna be the Bugs Bunny. We're the Elmer Fudd right now. We're arguing against ourselves. We're talking ourselves out of things. You know what Republicans do? Republicans try things. Republicans try things that sound nuts. And then they just like let the courts figure it out. Let someone else decide whether or not it was okay after the fact. Like we need to start, and I and I, you know, maybe I'll eat my words here. We need to start asking for forgiveness instead of permission. We need yeah. to start just trying things because we've been asking for permission for too long. They don't ask for permission, they just do things. We need to start doing things. Okay, we can't bring uh we can't we can't put abortion clinics on federal land. Why not? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. You know, right. let's okay. Oh, the, so the issue is you're worried that people won't be safe. Send people to protect them and like let the courts say that that's not okay. You know, like why aren't we trying things? Why aren't we being a little bit bolder? I think now is not a time to talk ourselves out of action that could help people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yet, that is precisely what the White House believes is the way forward. Um, he, let's see, I'm trying to find where this, but this is also in that Reuters article, basically admitting um, that this is not gonna help them in November. That if they do anything bold, that that will turn people away from the polls. And again, if you needed any more of any more evidence that they are, they don't care about young people, about women's votes, about the LGBTQ plus vote, about people of color votes, about all the votes of the people whose civil rights are currently being stripped away from this extremist Supreme Court. It's this, it's that those actions, any kind of clinic on federal land, getting people plan C, whatever it is, that feels too radical for them because they want the middle sliver. 
that sort of middle, like the piece of pie has already been eaten, but they're like, there's still some crumbs and they want that middle sliver of voters. Those like maybe conservative to Republic, I mean, conservative to Democrat swing voter, the elusive swing voter. It looks like um, not just Joe Biden, but um, even progressives like Pramila Jayapal, Representative Jayapal, um, or Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, fundraisers inside and outside of um, of Congress are dead set on voting harder. This is the message that will come out of the Supreme Court justice rulings on Roe v. Wade, on Dobbs, that it isn't about taking action, but it is about putting it back to the people to vote even harder. So let's take a look at this clip from Elizabeth Warren. But it's also focused like a laser on the election in November. And we get two more senators on the Democratic side, two senators who are willing to protect access to abortion and get rid of the filibuster so that we can pass it. And yes, John Fetterman, I'm looking at you in Pennsylvania. Mandela Barnes, I'm looking at you in Wisconsin. We bring them in, then we've got the votes and we can protect every woman, no matter where she lives. So that is a big promise um, from uh, a senator who is also, to her credit, advocating for other action um, beyond what, let's say, the president is advocating for in terms of opening clinics on federal lands, um, taking executive action um, to protect the right um, to get an abortion in this country. Um, but she's also giving some, and this is the question, is this hard, hard reality, hard truth about the election that's coming up? I want to jump down to this is from CNN, obviously reminding us that Democrats can hold the Senate by merely reelecting incumbents. <laughs> merely, <laughs> that's a fun word. Uh, in Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and New Hampshire, all states Biden won in 2020. They can't keep them all. Pennsylvania and Wisconsin provide chances to flip Republican seats in two more states Biden won. So it's holding on to these and adding two more. Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. In the House, Republicans need and Republicans need a net gain of only four seats, a fraction of the average historical gain for the party, not holding the White House to recapture the majority. It is a tenuous majority, and we've known this. We open the show talking about the filibuster. We know that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are not budging on that issue and are not budging on so many issues and have been basically um, just kind of linebackers against progress. Um, but here you have you know, someone like Elizabeth Warren giving us some hard truths. You've got, um, Pramil, again, Pramila Jayapal and others. I wanna play this one clip for you. This is the um, Democratic Super PAC Priorities USA also laying out uh, the importance of voting in November. The only way to change that at the federal level is to elect two more Democratic senators in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania to protect our seats in Colorado and Georgia and Arizona and to do everything we can to hold the House. So there you have it. This appears to be the strategy. We see the limitations of this administration. We see what they're not willing to do to protect Roe and protect abortion rights. Ergo, we're focusing in on November. It felt crass on Friday, still feels pretty damn crass. But Aaron, I did want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, they're not wrong that we need two more senators. That's that's so not wrong, but it's also so demoralizing to, to not act because we are anticipating getting two more senators would be complete folly. It yes. would be so, so silly. This is what we have right now. So, and we might not have it in November. Like, do you remember in 2020 when we were positive that we were gonna take the Senate? There were some people talking about taking the Senate, you know, 55 seats. We were gonna unseat Susan Collins. We were gonna do all of this stuff and none of it happened. All of the down ballot races at the federal level, Republicans overperformed in 2020. Mm -hmm. So Democrats didn't perform the way that they wanted to, even though Biden 
one, I don't know why we would trust even polling that came out this week in the wake of Dobbs that showed Democrats ex like experiencing like a net bump in polling and in, in you know because of the decision. We can't trust polls. We can't we can't trust that we're going to win more seats in the House and the Senate in November. We cannot trust the upcoming election. Let's do what we can now. Let's do more than what we can now. Let's ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness and not permission now. And then do what we can with the next Congress that we have. I don't like this kicking the can down the road thing. I find it to be very craven. I find it to be, and I don't think that the, that this is the case when it comes to representatives, uh, Representative Jayapal or Elizabeth Warren. But I have seen like fundraising appeals off of the Dobbs decision, of course. and that is gross to me. Yeah. I, I don't want to focus on raising money for an election that's coming up. I don't want to focus on doing work for the election that's coming up. I want to get done what can get done now and then make decisions based on what happens in November. Right, and, and as you mentioned with the incredible analogy to Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd, like basically now Elmer Fudd is convincing the American voters to be the Elmer Fudd and they're mm -hmm. doing the Bugs Bunny on Democrats. Right, mm -hmm. they're trying to, you know, dupe us into being like, oh, I swear, I promise, I promise that we'll do this because um, Mitch McConnell said a thing. Like, who are you banking your promise on? Oh, because Kirsten Cinema said a thing. Because Joe Manchin said a thing. Because every single senator, I'm sorry, do we have their like sworn testimony uh, written in blood? Do we have like a little a little blood oath going on? Like, mm -hmm. what what is? You know, we have a pinky swear happening. Like, yeah. how do we know all these senators will, in fact, do what they? I mean, and it's so it's you're holding us hostage without actually giving us the plan, right? Mm -hmm. So you say, what is your plan of action? And if it isn't this, if it isn't A, then it's B, and if it isn't B, then it's C, and if it isn't, and by the way, I think it should be Plan C, and I think that should be free for everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> I do, you know, you they're still squeezing us. Man, and I feel like, yes, a vote in 2020 for Joe Biden, in my opinion, was a strategic vote against fascism. And I think that mattered. And yet, I also believe that the pitch that the Democratic Party was making in 2020 was vote us in and we will steer us clear of this fascist takeover. We will right the ship. We will turn it around. We will. We're. We know we're hanging off the cliff here. Not. Hey, we're gonna fall. But here's like a you know a like a very small some water wings. Maybe you'll survive when we crash. That's utter crap. It is not enough. And so, I do want to. And I know we need to take polling with a with a grain of salt. But this was interesting. The YouGov poll with CBS News, Roe v. Wade, and the midterms overturning them. It makes you do what? Democrats say. 50% more likely to vote, 8% less likely, 52% no effect. Republicans, interestingly, only 20% more likely to vote and 77% say no effect. So clearly there's minimal more sort of a, a minimal more of a fire being lit underneath Democrats than Republicans, which is very interesting because you got Mike Pence doing, you know, victory laps here. Um, but it doesn't seem to be stirring the base and you wonder maybe that's cuz most people in America even if they're republicans believe in a woman's right to choose mm -hmm. um but but i i almost feel like democrats look at that and they're like yeah hell yeah doing nothing it actually kind of works just scaring them that kind of works mm -hmm. um final words Aaron. Yeah, you know, here's the thing you mentioned earlier about uh that Joe Biden was going for this m middle Vote right, mm -hmm. the kind of like, oh, I'm a, you know, I live in a suburb, but you know, I I have a gay friend, you know, that sort of <laughs> vote. Yeah. Um, the thing is, abortion rights are so popular that that middle vote on that issue doesn't exist. Like, mm -hmm. I, I what is it like, sixty percent of people didn't want to overturn Roe. That is like, he's appealing not to the middle. He's appealing to like the right like the far right and they wouldn't vote for him anyway. I feel the same about like other issues that I think would be really advantageous for Democrats to bring up right now. Okay, look, abortion is banned in a lot of places. So why don't we have a federal family leave program? Yep. You know, why aren't Republicans bluffs being called? If you care about families so much, let's support them. Let's make motherhood a little bit easier as we figure out a way to un-f what has been effed. You yes. know, like let's 
figure out a way to support the people that are going to be forced to have children. Uh, Democrats aren't doing that either. I, I really wish, like you said, that there was a clear plan like, guys, there is no we got this, but we have a plan for how we're going to attack this. And right. I wish we knew the plan of attack and I wish we could see it in action. Right now, it just feels like I'm, I'm putting a lot of messages in my spam folder and I'm unsubscribing from a bunch of texts asking for money. And I need more than that from Democrats. I love that. And you know that, you know, you could, Joe Biden loves bipartisanship and calling Republicans bluff on whether or not they are a pro family party by putting together a robust parental leave, universal child care program. Child tax um, credit. Why don't child we extend expand, the, Why do we extend it child. for longer? Like it is so, it's right there. We were just doing it. Yep. Like, why? Just bring it back. Yep. Why not? It's, it's, I don't want to be the president ever. It seems like a hard job that sucks. <laughs> but like, I feel like maybe Joe Biden should listen to people who have some ideas around what could be done, what could be made out of this situation. I think it's terrible in almost all respects, but also presents some opportunities to actually enact some change. Absolutely. All right, we got to take our first break. There is way more on the other side of this. Uh, including, you know, with everything, one step forward and five steps back for the Democrats. But uh, we'll be right back. All right, damage report. Francesca Fiorentini, Aaron Ryan, we are back. It is Thursday. There is more to do and more to say, especially when it comes to the right to choose in this country. Um, so. As Joe Biden has said that he will support a filibuster amendment or a lifting in order to pass a Roe v. Wade legislation, um, he is simultaneously seem to be cutting backdoor deals to appoint um, lifetime judges, federal judges who are anti-choice. That's right, this deal is struck with none other than minority Senate leader Mitch McConnell Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, according to the Louisville Courier Journal, Biden has agreed to nominate attorney attorney Chad Meredith. Once there's a federal court vacancy in Kentucky where abortion was outlawed immediately following the high court's ruling in Dobbs. In exchange, this is why he would do it people. McConnell has purportedly agreed not to obstruct the president's future judicial nominations. Do we believe that? Um, cool. Uh, cool. Uh, that's great. You, your your friend seems like a really cool guy. Um, let's more about Chad Meredith. Chad Meredith is the attorney who previously served as Kentucky's Solicitor General and represented a number of Kentucky's top GOP officials in cases curbing abortion access. And of course, COVID-19 public health measures. Um, specifically, Meredith represented Kentucky's then governor, Matt Bevin, in a 2019 legal battle against an abortion clinic, saying at one point that effectively eliminating access to abortion in the state would have a negligible impact on women seeking the procedure. He also defended a 2017 law requiring doctors to perform an ultrasound and describe the image to a patient before providing an abortion. I don't get me started. This is according to the Louisville Courier Journal. Um, so here you go. Here is what the um, the master legislator, I guess, the head of the Democratic Party is willing to do when it comes to abortion rights is give Mitch McConnell a win in Kentucky by appointing um, this anti-choice attorney to be a federal judge, a lifetime appointment. And then what, the rest of his appointments go through, through hunky dory? Aaron, I, I have to get your thoughts on this. Wow, gee, I wonder if a Republican would lie about something in order to get what they want and then suffer absolutely no consequences as a result of it. There is nothing here that would hold McConnell to this promise but his honor, which does he have on here? Like, what, what, what is the, okay, like you're Mitch McConnell, right? You can get Joe Biden and Democrats or whatever to believe you when you make promises. 
And then there's no penalty for you when you break those promises. And then they'll believe you again when you make more promises to get what you want. Why wouldn't you just lie and make fake promises all the time? This is like yeah. an economically set, like we're talking economics like more broadly than money. This is an economically sound decision by Mitch McConnell to just continually make promises, lie, break promises, suffer no consequences, do the same thing again. I mean, it's not even like he's under oath. Supreme Court justices that were confirmed under Trump lied under oath. (laughs) So like, and they've suffered no consequences and they won't suffer any consequences because President Biden doesn't wanna make them have any type of code of conduct that they have to live under or be subjected to as their judges. Like here's, this would be the genius move by Biden. No, I'm giving him a lot more, whatever, Joe Biden, if you're watching this. Joe Biden should say, yes, I, I promise to appoint this guy to get the appointment, get the lack of you know pushback on his other federal judicial nominees, and then smack down a five year term limit. So it's like mm. this guy is in and, and see, cause then we get to be Lucy with the football instead of like Charlie Brown's butt as he falls on it <laughs> trying to kick it. Absolutely, no, I, I, you know he's not going to do that. He's, he's not. He want to do that because he's too nice. Ugh. We need no. a mean president. We need a mean Democrat. Who's a mean Democrat? I mean, uh, God, there's a, a Bernie is mean. Everyone Bernie thinks Bernie is, is too loud and angry. That was his, everything about he's him. Cantankerous. I think he's a mean Democrat. I don't know if if this is somebody I would vote for. Amy Klobuchar is a mean Democrat. I think she would run. She would run the country like a mean person. Uh, we she, need a mean president. She ate salad with a with a comb, out of spite. <laughs> out of spite. <laughs> if that doesn't show you, you're willing to go to lengths just to prove whatever point. Like I don't know what does. Um, but no, it's true. It's it's interesting because you have politics and then you have tactics. And Joe Biden has moderate milk toast politics. And moderate milk toast tactics. So Klobuchar is someone I disagree with politically. I think she's far too centrist, and yet I think she her tactics to actually even defend the line, defend the gains that the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not a liberal institution. All right, it is not a progressive institution. It is it it has followed precedent actually and expanded rights, but sort of with. Arm twi- arms twisted and cases made in front and put in front of them. Um, now you have a very much an activist Supreme Court, and we're getting get into a couple of rulings, and you have to act accordingly. But again, not like this. And Biden, this is this is months after Biden said that that Mitch McConnell is a man of honor. So of course, why would he lie to you? He's never going to lie to me. He can't lie to me. And yet, as Aaron mentioned, if he does. Which he definitely will, uh, you know, wither the women of Kentucky. Um, what's the consequence? Nothing. Joe Biden doesn't lose anything. He doesn't. I mean, let's be real. He doesn't have a uterus. Like, like he doesn't. Like, you know, I mean, is he thinking about his daughters, his grandchildren? Like, is it is it that calculation? But it's again, there's so many people who have nothing to lose and who have no experience with any of this. I'm thinking of that viral tweet about how a woman was like. I had an ex-boyfriend who thought that my eggs were covered in a hard shell in my ovaries. <laughs> and I, I that means I don't trust men to legislate all women's it bodies. Is, it is like obscene that we are even having this conversation, Francesca, that this is like, a, not, not that you brought it up because it's obviously like relevant. But the fact that like what people with uteruses are allowed to do with them, the fact that it's a public discussion, Yep. is so, it's like obscene. I think every once in a while, it's important for us to step back and talk about what we're doing here. We're having a conversation about the government's right, the mostly male government's right to tell women and people with uteruses what to do with their body. Like what? This is mm-hmm. a, this is an obscene conversation. We should not be having the conversation. I just, I cannot believe we're here. And I cannot believe right now we are talking about a 
mostly men who are who are themselves too old to father children safely and a couple you know and the, the women on the supreme court all too old to give birth to children nobody making these decisions can give birth like yep. and they are about a part of the population i'm sorry i feel sometimes like i'm on mushrooms when i talk about this like why yeah. do i have hands it's like what is this conversation why are we having this conversation it's it's horrifying to me. The and worst the trip ever. That is a waste. The worst of mushrooms. Terrible. What? It, I knew that they were the wrong kind of mushrooms. I shouldn't <laughs> have trusted. You never trust somebody named Chad. Also, no, no. This judge, Chad, mushroom he, dealer. Chad. He gave it to you in like, yeah, the Chad Meredith's like, here's some dirty shrooms. I'm sorry, this is, <laughs> but, but it does feel like what we're living in. We gotta. That's we. Good. I want to move on because obviously it isn't just Roe v. Wade. It's a lot of other stuff. It is a dismantling of essentially any kind of regulatory ability of the federal government um, to protect us. Uh, and one of those ways that they protected us was protecting our right to decide if and when and how we become parents. Um, right, that right to an abortion. But there are other rights that are being stripped away as well. So um, climate change. Uh, in in a blow to the fight against climate change, the Supreme Court on Thursday limited how the nation's main anti-air pollution law can be used to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. So this is a 6-3 vote and the court said that the Clean Air Act does not give Environmental Protection Agency broad authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants that control global warming. The Environmental Protection Agency, like you're more just like window dressing. You're just there. You just, you know, it's cute, like nice try, but no. Uh, why? Because, you know, corporations need somewhere to dump stuff air, water, land, wherever. Um, the implications of the ruling could extend well beyond environmental policy and further signal that the court's newly expanded conservative majority is deeply skeptical of the power of the administrative agencies to address major issues facing the nation and the planet. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, it's totally, they're like, well, you know, we, we should go about it a different way. No, 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 no. They don't care. They don't want there to be oversight, whether that's corporate oversight, definitely not government oversight. This is all, again, Steve Bannon just put on another shirt over his three shirts and is like, yeah, today's gonna be a four shirt day, Steve. Like he loves this because this is his dream of dismantling the administrative state as he has been quoted a million times is the goal of a Trump administration. While Trump is not in office, this is the lasting impact of his time there. Mm -hmm. um, before I kick it to you, let's hear from Justice Kagan in her dissent writing, the stakes here are high, yet the court today pre prevents congressionally authorized agency action to curb power plants carbon dioxide emissions. The court appoints itself instead of Congress or the expert agency, the decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening, respectfully, I dissent. No, you don't need respectfully, just leave that no, out. No, no, if I were editing that, I'd just like line item cross that one out, just <laughs> I dissent without Respect. I mean, whatever. They don't respect us. Why would we respect them? Um, you know, the the thing about this, the EPA ruling was, you know, this is another thing that we saw coming. But to me, especially when put up against the Dobbs ruling and some of the like sanctimonious language used by the far right and talking about protecting life, talking about protecting, 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 mm -hmm. you know, babies or whatever. You no know, one protects life. Not living in a polluted hellhole. Like there is no group in the population that is more subject to harm from environmental pollutants than quote unquote the unborn. You know, pregnant people, pregnant women are very easily sickened and harmed by environmental toxins. So the types of things that the EPA is supposed to regulate actually serve to protect the unborn. This yeah. only serves to drive home the point to me that conservatives don't even care about the unborn. They don't care about the unborn. Let's not even give them that. If they cared about the unborn, they'd care about the environment in which the unborn were becoming the born. And mm -hmm. they don't they don't. 
They care about forcing birth and they care about uh, an agenda that is a white Christian nationalist state agenda, which is a whole other conversation. And I feel like I need a tinfoil hat for that one. Um, but <laughs> no, you don't, you don't. I mean, not maybe anymore. 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 20 years ago, I always say this, the anecdote of like, uh, you know, when I was marching on the streets against the Iraq war, we'd be like, no Bush, no KKK, no fascist USA. And like back then I was like, okay, but like KKK, fascist, you're like, well, not really relevant Bush, yeah. And now I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, that chant is good. Uh, that's a good chant. Yeah, you were chant. right. <laughs> you were right. You were you were right. The chant, the chant was fine. It's fine. It'd be fine today too. Yeah. yeah, this this EPA thing is really upsetting. Also, you know, in the opinion, which I think Roberts wrote, um, he's so like dismissive of pollution and global warming. I think he called it the the cause of the day or or something like Oof. that. And it's just like, sir. Sir, you know, for somebody who's as vain about their legacy as he is reportedly, uh, this is a really bad call because this is going to be something that people always remember him for. In addition to, you know, Citizens United, Dobbs, yes. other terrible decisions that happened under the Roberts court. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a bad move. It's going to hurt people. It's going to hurt the precious unborn that the right the right loves to uh, hold up as these like people that we must protect at all costs. It's going to hurt families. It's going to hurt mothers. It's going to hurt all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm not looking forward to what this will uh, bring. No. And and before we go to break, one more um, one more aspect, one more thing that the Supreme Court did rule. Um, Mini bit of good news and then, or no, mini bit of bad news and then, well, I don't know how to do this, but it's fine. Um, but in in another ruling, um, the Supreme Court ruled for the first time in its history that states have concurrent jurisdiction with federal government, with the federal government to prosecute a broad swath of crimes in Indian country, tribal lands, dealing with a dealing a grievous blow to tribal sovereignty. So this is a five four ruling, Brett Kavanaugh. Um, by Brett Kavanaugh shredding almost 200 years of precedent and practice to satisfy Oklahoma's desire to reverse its defeat two years ago in McGirt versus Oklahoma, where the court recognized that half of the state was still Indian country. Um, again, this is overriding tribal law. It's allowing um, all kinds of, uh, again, overreach and, and, and ignoring that tribal sovereignty. And it covers reservations of many tribes in Oklahoma, like the Muscogee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Quapaw, and Seminole. And um, lastly, just for, to quote a Muscogee um, nation, they said, the ruling is an alarming step, back, step backwards for, for justice in our reservation. Tribal governments in collaboration with federal government are best suited to protect our people and administer justice within our reservations. Um, so there was already oversight. It's not that there wasn't any kind of federal law on those lands. This is just adding another um, piece of it. Finally, I'm sorry, we, we gotta go to break, but finally, um, mini bit of good news. Supreme Court allows the Biden administration to terminate the controversial Trump era asylum policy known as remain in Mexico. Super surprising um, that, it, that they even got this far. Again, this has led to Things like deaths, um, I mean, next step is to overturn Title 42, which the Biden administration tried to, um, but we got to fight for that as well. So uh, that was a surprising one, but we have to go to break. I'm sorry, you're gonna get you, uh, give you comments, but we'll be right back after this. <laughs> oh, all right, we've got a little bit left in this hour, um, so let's jump into this Marjorie Taylor Greene is somehow always a little bit right for the wrong reasons. And I say it like maybe 3%, 2% right. And she's always making headlines by being three or 2% right. Admitting that global warming exists, having no idea why it's caused or admitting that it exists and then relishing it. All the business opportunities that will come from everyone, you know, searching for water. Uh, so here she was yesterday on Twitter um, with something that I that there's a little bit of a through line with the crazies like MTG writing, why are so many food manufacturing and processing plants catching fire? Why did thousands of cattle all die in a heat wave? Usually just the old sick or weak die in stressful conditions, not the whole herd. Food security is national security. 
Okay, so <laughs> that last part, <laughs> that's that one. That's that one percent of like, oh gosh, security is national security. Oh my gosh, yes, good job, Marjorie. Good job. Thirty-three percent. See me after class. <laughs> um, it's not a zero. It's a thirty-three. But there are a lot of people are jumping to conclusions in her mentions because uh, she noticed she didn't even say climate change. She's just like, why do cows die in heat? Hmm? Is it because they're made of Jewish space laser? Like it's like <laughs> she doesn't know why an animal would die in like. So here we have some responses. This is Mina Singh's writing. So you'll acknowledge climate change and global warming? Huh? Eh? No? Um, Hope Barrett saying, just waiting on your thoughtful insight on these things that will have nothing to do with global warming or acknowledge anything that is going on in the rest of the world, but will be a part of some big conspiracy, which, oh yeah, it is. So notice how she didn't really say global warming. She's just asking questions about why cows are dying. We all know that again, 2022, hottest year on record. I don't even have to look at the stats to know that. I don't even have to look. I know it's the hottest year on record because that's the world we're living in. It's mostly on fire. And then there's, you know, poke. I don't know. Um, so actually, this is not the first time she has asked questions around um around, you know, why like food processing centers are 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 are, you know going up in flames and what what's happening to crops and all this. So here's a video of her, if you guys remember earlier from this year, where she's blaming Democrats for ruining farmers lives. And yeah, all of this is a QAnon conspiracy theory, but take a look at this video. Our farmers are, they stand for all of our values, traditional family values, freedom, independence, the ability to live and sustain yourself and your family off the land. The Biden administration and Democrats are ruining that. And they're destroying the very important, most critical part of the fabric of America. And that is our farmers. And I'm so upset about this. that It has me so angry, but they're doing it on purpose. I mean, they want, they want to be the global economy. They want to be completely involved. And here we have these random, supposedly accidental fires at food processing plants. So- this is not unique for conspiracy theorists like Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, who in 2018 alleged that California wildfires were caused by, again, a laser fired from a satellite controlled by a Jewish family. Uh, Green is in Congress now, but she's still pushing conspiracy theories that globalists are deliberately starting catastrophic fires to advance their agenda. So what, so we can buy more cattle from Brazil? like? This is the depth of this. So it's like I saw the tweet and I was like, <laughs> yeah, food security is national. Oh, you know dang. what's funny? You know what's funny about that? About all the points she's making about our farmers and this like pearl clutching red state ah shucksery that you get from Republicans all the time. What percentage of the food supply in the US comes from California? Hellish. Yeah. Blue state California. It's really nice to see Marjorie Taylor Greene come out in support of the state where I live, California, the home of so much of America's agricultural production. Um, yeah, I, the just asking question thing, I think just is doing a lot of work because she's definitely not thinking. She's mm -hmm. just asking. Um, I also do not believe that Marjorie Taylor Greene knows how to cultivate anything. She doesn't seem like the type of person who's ever grown anything, ever successfully kept an animal alive, or really like Marjorie. You're so you're so good. At, I mean, look, I'm I'm also like coming a little bit for her because I grew up in a rural area and we had like chickens and sheep and I milked cows and all that stuff. Um, tell me how how does how does uh you know calf birth work, Marjorie? Ever assisted a cow birth? You ever mm -hmm. farmed? Tell me about farming. Tell me what you know about farming. She just repeats things that she sees in the craziest parts of the Twitter sphere. And her people who are her acolytes believe it. And it's very frustrating as somebody who actually has some firsthand experience actually being on a farm, being around farmers, and like knowing what these things look like. It's just she's she's stealing valor. Honestly. Yeah. Feeling feeling farmers. The other thing that I think is so important to know about farming and like running farms is the amount of 
labor that is required and often that labor is immigrant labor, whether documented mm -hmm. or undocumented. And I've spoken to and we've all done stories about this that like the the more the more robust our immigration policies, the more safe they are for people, the more actual like people there are to work these farms, these American farms, if we mm -hmm. love these American farms um, so much. But no, that conflicts with our anti-immigrant stance. Um, <sighs> anyway, uh, that is that is Marjorie Taylor Greene's sort of self own of the week, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. There is more show on YouTube if you're on Linear. Meet us there. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.